by your spirit that we may hear what your word speaks. Amen. Can I can I say something first? Should we let her? Okay. <laughs> okay. Wait, I got to get this out of here. Uh, all right. So in the paper this past week, there was um, a discovery, and it's in the um, United Arab uh, Emirates, and they really just look like kind of holes in the ground. But they said they're they're they think they were early Christian uh, monasteries, mm -hmm. and and that was interesting. But then they said, um, and I was thinking, now this is 500 years after what we're talking about. Um, but here there th these cities that that they're trying to keep together and to keep this Christian community growing. And he said, but uh, the two monasteries became lost in history in the sands of time, as scholars believe Christians slowly converted to Islam as that faith grew more prevalent in the region. And I thought that was interesting that they gave up their belief in Christ and chose to listen to the they weren't listening to what John was vision, John's vision. They were seeing um, uh, Muhammad's vision. Understand that this is a very tenuous time in history that many people converted not by choice, but under the threat of death. The same thing that was happening during the Inquisition when the Christian church was converting people to their faith under the threat of death. And if you're rooted in that region and that's where your ancestry and your heritage lies, if you're given the choice of either having to flee that and start over somewhere else, dying or converting to another faith, quite often many people converted. It's kind of a a matter of the time that they were living in. And it's, it's sad, but that was the reality that that church was facing. Um, and we'll get into that as we start to go a little bit further down this road when we start to look at persecutions and things like that. Um, history isn't pretty. <laughs> And a lot of people, for the sake of convenience, more or less sold out their faith. And, and you have to ask yourself, you know, what if suddenly today in this age, it was illegal to be a Christian? What would you do? Would you continue to profess your faith or would you simply go with whatever it is you're told to do. And that's what's coming. We're gonna see that as we get through this book a little bit further. Those are the very real issues that people are gonna be facing, not just here, but throughout the world. It's been going on since the beginning. That's what I say, this whole idea of all of this is fairly circular. You know, what goes around comes around and, and we see that, especially when it comes to persecuting the church. But we're jumping ahead. <laughs> but thank you, Joanne, for bringing that because it was a fascinating, fascinating story. But it's just that very real reminder of what the church has faced throughout the ages. Taking a quick look back, um, we're at this part where John is seeing these seven seals being opened. We looked at the first six of them last week, and those were things that have been playing out throughout human history. It's that seventh seal that now takes it to the next level. This is where we're going to go into greater detail regarding the end. And, and that seventh seal ushers in seven trumpets, and then seven bowls. So each time we get to the end of these groupings, we see it go down another level or up another level, depending on how you want to look at it, and seeing it being portrayed in greater detail. But there's that curious little interlude between the sixth and the seventh seal where we saw those two visions of the multitudes, the 144,000 that 
were in heaven and then the great multitude on earth and dressed in white. And they'd have nothing to do with the seals. But it's this interlude that John brings in that says, oh, and by the way, I saw this. But what it does is it serves as a pause, kind of a breaking point. And John has this way in his writing of doing these little literary tricks that point us to what's coming next. And so when we see these interludes, and we're going to see another one coming up, um, he's really saying, okay, we're finished with what's come before. And now what's going to come next is shifting gears, and it's even more important than what came before it. And so when we see that interlude between the seals, it, it gives us this idea that, okay, we're about to shift gears, and John is going to take us down even deeper in all of this. So who would like to read? In chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Hold up, go ahead. I'm reading out of the message today. Ooh, I like it. Change it up. When the lamb ripped off the seventh seal, heaven fell quiet, complete silence for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who are always in readiness before God handed seven trumpets. Then another angel carrying a gold censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a great quantity of incense so that he could offer up the prayers of all the holy people of God on the golden altar before the throne. Smoke billowed up from the incense laced prayers of the holy ones, rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel filled the censer with fire from the altar and have heaved it to earth. It set off thunders, voices, lightnings, and an earthquake. Thank you. I like that. I like that. Makes it readable. That's what I love about the message. Um, Open the seventh seal and there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, remember, the vision we'd seen earlier of heaven is this constant singing and praising God and falling down before his throne. And now all of a sudden, there is silence. Remember that old commercial for the investment firm E.F. Hutton? You would show a restaurant and everybody would be talking and somebody would be talking with somebody else and go, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton and E.F. Hutton says, and everybody went silent. And the tagline was when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, when the seventh seal is broken, all of heaven listens. They pay attention because they know what this means. They don't know the details of what's coming, but what they know is this is now about to get really serious. And that's the image for us. When John gives us that little glimpse of silence, it's shifting gears for us. And we're no longer going to be looking at things that are, they're troubling, but then they fade and then they come back again. What we're going to see now is this progression of things that just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And it all starts when that angel takes the incense, takes the fire off of the altar and hurls it to earth. Fire in scripture has always represented God's judgment. The incense represents the prayers. It's that image of the altar of incense in the temple or in the tabernacle where the high priest would, would stand and intercede for the people. 
It would be the priest's job to come before the altar, come before God with the prayers of the people, and that incense would burn, and he'd place it on that altar. Well, now this is the reverse of that. As the result of all of the prayers of the people, now it's time for judgment to begin. We don't like that word judgment. It seems a little harsh. It seems a little nasty. It seems a little negative. It doesn't fit our image of a loving and forgiving God. But the flip side of the loving and forgiving God is also the just God, the righteous God who has said all along, thou shall not do X, Y, and Z. This is what it means to worship me. This is what it means to have a relationship with me. And if you cross that line, there will be consequences. We don't like that idea of sin and consequence, but that's the reality. And notice that it's the prayers of the saints, the people here on earth, not the ones that we saw earlier, the martyrs under the altar, but it's the prayers of God's people that usher in the beginning of the end. We don't know how many prayers it takes. All we know is that it's in response to the prayers that God will finally move and act. You realize that every time we're in worship and we say the Lord's Prayer, we're really praying for this. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will, not my will, God, but your will. And your will is being played out right here. And so really we're asking for God to move and to bring judgment and justice into the world, not on our terms, but on his terms. And it's the culmination of all of those prayers where God finally says, okay, it's time. It's time to move. It's time to act. And so we see these seven trumpets now brought into play. And, and trumpets historically have been used to usher in or herald things. You know, you, you get the image of the king riding into the castle and all of the people lining the walkway, blowing their trumpets, announcing his presence. Um, it's the same with the angelic trumpets. You're heralding in what God is going to do. So we're going to take these just like we did with the seals. We're going to take them one trumpet at a time and kind of pull them apart a little bit. So who would like to read verses six and seven? Susan? Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets made ready to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, which fell on the earth. And a third of the earth was burnt up, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Thanks. One of the things we're going to see with all of these trumpets, with the exception of one, they all echo the plagues that God brought onto Israel. Those plagues were designed to change Pharaoh's heart so he would let the Israelites go. Time after time after time, there was something brought upon the land until finally Pharaoh just threw up his hands and said, get out of here. And what we're seeing here is those plagues are being played out again. And that seventh plague in, Israel, or in Egypt was that plague of hail and fire falling down to the earth. Again, remember that, that fire is this image of God's judgment. And it said a third of the earth was burned. It's limited. Like so many other things that we've seen already, there is a limit 
to what God will allow to happen. Now, I got to tread carefully here. <laughs> there is a school of thought that says, look at our current climate situation. Look at the rising temperatures, look at the dryness, look at all of the fires that are breaking out throughout the world. Is this part of that judgment? Or is this just the consequence? It's a question I don't have an answer to. <laughs> But it shows us that there will be impacts. These first four trumpets that usher in all of these things, they're ushering in natural calamities. The last trumpets usher in calamities on human beings specifically, but these first four are natural calamities that have consequences. And now these first four calamities affect all people, including God's people. But there will come a time, just like he did in Egypt, where he's going to exclude his people from having to be affected by this. Joanne, you got a question? Oh. Um, I have a question. Yes, Diane. Well, um, in the... Hebrew scriptures, the prophets are writing about the coming doom and all, and there's always a reason of some sort. They've, they've disobeyed the covenant, and there's also an out. They can get back into, into God's good graces by getting back in the covenant, and what I don't see in this one is what the people have done, have done to cause this trouble, and what they might do to get out of it. It just... <laughs> there's not a lot of out in this. Because yeah. what we're going to see is as this goes on, people are going to simply refuse to turn to God. He's using this to try to get their attention. He's giving them that option to return. And the out is already there in Jesus. Oh, that's their out. Okay. That's their out. This is strictly a judgment on sin. People turning their backs on God and being blatantly disobedient. Okay, so that's that's basically the same as the prophets were saying. Right. You've done right. something against God's will, so it right. comes trouble. Yeah. Only this is the ultimate culmination, culmination of what the prophets had been foretelling. The prophets in the Old Testament spoke in two levels. They talked about the impending judgment on Israel or God's people and then quite often they would look to that day of the Lord that was to come. And this is the day of the Lord. They just skip the earthly part. Maybe. They skip the earthly part. Yeah. John isn't as concerned with the earthly stuff anymore because he's being given this vision of that great and powerful and terrible day of the Lord that's to come. That ushers in that final act of judgment. It's deep, <laughs> and we're going to try to keep it as understandable as possible, but that's what's happening here. Um, who would like to read verses 8 and 9? Pat? The second angel sounded his trumpet in something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Thanks. Echoing the first plague in Egypt when the Nile turned to blood and the fish died. It's getting a little more interesting to say. <laughs> now, it, it's hard for us to envision something like a mountain being thrown into the sea. People have speculated, is it gonna be a volcano that comes up out of the sea? 
and explodes? Is it going to be an earthquake that causes all of this stuff to happen? You know, tsunamis and all of that that's going to destroy all of the ships? Don't know. Don't know. All we know is that it's going to affect about a third of marine life. Who would like to read verses 10 and 11? Ellen? The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many died from the many died from the waters because it made it was made bitter. Thank you. Thank you. This is a trumpet that doesn't have a corollary in the plagues of Egypt. In fact, this is the opposite of a miracle that took place as the Israelites were on their way out of Egypt. They came to that place called Mara where the water was bitter. And God told Moses to throw a branch into the water to make it pure. Now, this is the opposite. Wormwood, it, it was a plant that was really bitter, had a really strong taste and really bitter. It wouldn't kill you, but it would make things horribly tasting. And so what's, what we're seeing happen here is really a third of the world's water is going to be polluted and undrinkable. It doesn't take much imagination to see that we're already starting to see a lot of these things taking place. The million dollar question, which I don't have an answer to, is this the beginning of the end or is this again, just another one of the cycles that we're going through? And the reality is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if this is the beginning of the end or if this is just another cycle of human history, what matters is that we keep our focus on what's truly important through all of this. And that's remembering that at the end of the day, no matter what's going on, Jesus wins. And that's what we celebrate. That's what we cling to. That at the end of the day, no matter what, Jesus wins. The world is a nasty, ugly, broken, fallen, sinful place. And it's going to affect and impact many, many, many people, not just here, but throughout the world. But it's into that mess that we have been called to be a light that shines. And the idea behind all of this, it's the idea behind the church. That as things get nasty, people are going to look at the church and see that those people have something that I want. There's, there's a calmness. There's a peace. That's, oh, there's a kitty. <laughs> Talk about calmness and peace. <laughs> That's what was happening in Rome in those early days when the Christians were being persecuted. Their neighbors were looking at them and saying, you guys are nuts. Don't you know that you're going to be killed for what you believe? And the people would say, yeah. So, because I know that there's more to this life than this. And they would have that calmness about them in the midst of a chaotic world that would attract people and say, tell me more about this Jesus. Because I want what you have for me. And so through all of this, as things start to unravel, God is going to be using the church to bring that message of peace and hope and love. To be that answer that people are looking for. There are so many people who have the idea that the church is going to be taken away from all of this. 
And that's not God's purpose. God's purpose is to use his church to advance his kingdom. God's people will be spared from a lot of this, as we're going to see coming up. But just like the Egyptians, there were the people in Israel who were still affected by a lot of those plagues. But then as it started to get more personal, they were spared. And it's going to be the same way at the end. But we're not quite there yet. Um, who would like to read verses 12? Actually, it's just verse 12. Joanne? Oops, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> Either that or I'm losing my hearing. It's, it's there we go. Oh, they can keep me quiet. <laughs> I've been looking for that mute, voice, mute button for my wife for years. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> then the fourth angel blew his trump. A third of the sun. A third of and a third of the lost of its burning. There's no light during a third of, third of the night also. That's 12. We can't hear you. You were really broken up on that. Somebody else want to try? What verses were, were just verse, verse 12. I can read it. Okay. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. Thanks, thanks. Again, reminiscent of the ninth plague in Egypt that plague of darkness when darkness covered the land. God's people had to endure that back then. It wasn't just dark over the Egyptians and the Israelites had lights shining. It was dark over the whole land. And it's the same way here. There's going to be a darkness over the land. One of the things that we saw at the very beginning was this idea of a blessing for those who heard these words and put them into practice. One of the blessings is knowing there's some things to look for before things happen. And if we're around at that time and it suddenly gets dark over a third of the earth, might want to pay attention, just saying, just saying. Um, it's not going to be, some people have said, well, this is just an eclipse. It's not going to be that because it's not just the sun or the moon that's affected. It is going to be dark and it's going to be really dark. And that is going to be a sign that there's something that's about to come. So who would like to read just verse 13 for me? Sue? Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew in mid heaven. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets which the three angels are about to blow. I like that. I like that, this, this image of seeing this eagle flying. And eagles usually fly kind of at about, you know, 45 degree in the horizon when they're up there circling. They fly high enough that you can see. And you've got this eagle that's circling around, calling out to the people, warning them, whoa, 
whoa, whoa. Because really, if you think it's bad up till now, <laughs> this is that warning that it's going to get even worse. Again, Diane was saying, you know, there doesn't seem to be an out <laughs> in this. Well, this is one of those great opportunities for people to have that change of heart. If you've gone through all of what you've gone through already through these first four trumpets, here's your opportunity to say, oh, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I need to pause and repent. What was interesting is when we parallel this with what was going on in Egypt back with the Israelites, there were many Egyptians who saw what was happening and saw how God was protecting the Israelites. And there were many Egyptians who stopped worshiping their Egyptian gods and started worshiping God because of what they were seeing. They weren't stupid. They could see that God was judging their land. And they finally said, hey, wait a minute. That God is a whole lot more powerful than the God we're worshiping. I want to worship that one. And so this is that pause. This is that interlude again that's going to allow people an opportunity to repent, but it's also going to signal in what's to come. So who would like to read in verse nine or chapter nine, verses one through six? Diane? And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given authority like the authority of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to damage the grass of the earth or any green growth or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torture them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will, die, they will long to die, but death will flee from them. Sounds like a marvelous experience to go through. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, this echoes the locust plague in Exodus, but there's a difference. In Exodus, it was the actual insects that came. And those insects devoured the crops throughout the region. This is not insects as we understand them. The best way to describe this and to kind of visualize it is this is a demonic horde that is released. They saw, John saw a star that fell from the sky or came from the sky. Some people see that as Satan. That, that's not true because what we're seeing throughout this whole book is that angels are the ones that are ushering in all of these things. They're the ones that God is using to start the process, if you will. Um, and that's what this context seems to indicate, that it was an angel that was sent for the specific purpose of releasing this demonic plague. Now, it talks about an abyss or a bottomless pit. Again, that's just figurative language. In the thinking of the day, there were three realms. There were the heavens, there was the earthly realm, and then the underworld. 
The heavens were seen as being the dwelling place of God. The earthly realm was being seen as the dwelling place of man. And the underworld was seen as being the place of Satan and demonic forces. It's at this point that we really have to set aside our logical Western minds and start to view things from a different perspective. There's not an actual literal bottomless pit. How deep is a bottomless pit? Don't know, don't know. There is a place, whether it's a physical place, a fourth dimensional place, however we want to look at it, there is a place where the demonic realm resides. We get little glimpse of it here. You'll see evil. I don't want to go into great detail, but I have been in the presence of what you would have to say is demonic influences. Scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> but it's real. What's going to happen is that that fifth trumpet, those forces are going to be unleashed on the non-believing world. This is where God sets that limit and says, you cannot touch those that have God's seal on their forehead. Now, it's not going to be an actual seal on our foreheads. Most commentators will say that that seal is the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about, that we are sealed and marked for God's purpose, set aside as being his children. Whatever it is, whatever it looks like, God's people are A, still here, and B, protected. They're protected. Now, what's different about this is that this trumpet, this plague, is having a direct impact on people. The first four had an impact on the world in which we live and affecting humans indirectly. This trumpet brings in the horde, if you will, that affects individuals. Who would like to read verse 7 through 12 for me? Hold it. I'm going to ask Holda, could you read this out of the message? Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. The locusts looked like horses ready for war. They had gold crowns, human faces, women's hair, the teeth of lions, and iron breastplates. The sound of their wings was the sound of horse-drawn chariots charging into battle. Their tails were equipped with stings like scorpion tails. With those tails, they were ordered to torture the human race for five months. They had a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, in Greek, Apollyon, destroyer. The first doom is past, two dooms yet to come. Thank you. Thank you. This is one of those places that really confuses people. Because we try to visualize what John was seeing. They have faces like people and stingers and hair and all that. And, we, and we're, our human brains are trying to wrap around that and say, that just doesn't make sense. John must have been smoking something. The reality is we're not really supposed to worry about what it looks like. It's this language of John 
painting this picture of something that's beyond our ability to understand. It's otherworldly, it's abnormal, but the biggest part to take away from it is, A, it's impacting people, and B, it's led by somebody named the destroyer. Think about that, destroyer. He's not there to build bridges and win friends and influence people. <laughs> He's seeking to destroy. He's seeking to destroy humanity. Sounds like Putin. <laughs> oh, let's not go there, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, again, this is limited. Five months. The average locust plague had about a five-month window when it would occur. Um, this is a limited invasion of a demonic horde that we can't describe or understand, led by somebody who's trying to destroy humanity. But they're not given the power to kill. Only to injure and cause pain. I think Joanne mentioned earlier how she was saying Martha had that desire to just give up. Imagine being in such agony that you simply want to die and you can't. There's no way out of your physical pain. Yeah, Pat. I'm a little confused. Are you saying for this fifth plague or fifth that that, that the Christians will be spared? Yes. Or not? Okay. We will be spared. Sure. Yeah, Christians will be spared. They will still be here. They just won't be inflicted by the plague, the horde. That's going to do a couple of things, folks. Again, it's going to be an opportunity to witness. But the flip side of it is it's also going to be an opportunity for Christians to become the scapegoats. How come it's not happening to you? You should have to suffer just like I am suffering. And what will happen through this time is the church is going to undergo intense persecution. It was just like back in Rome. When Rome started to decline and fall apart, Christians were seen as being the cause of it all. Because they didn't worship the gods of the Romans. They didn't worship the emperor. Rome was being judged and punished for that. So therefore, we have to get rid of the Christians. And what better way to get rid of them than throw them in a coliseum and feed them to lions or burn them at the stake or use them as torches to light your patio party? You know, all of those things were happening. Because Christians were seen as the reason why. Rome was declining. Christians are going to be seen as the reason why this is happening. We will be spared or the church will be spared from the physical impact of that plague. But we won't be spared from the corollary damage. Because the world isn't going to like what they're seeing. There's this another little interlude. The first woe is past, two other woes are yet to come, which is John's way of saying, okay, there's one down, two to go, and these get even worse. Who would like to read verses 13 through uh, let's go 13 through 21, 13 to the end. 
We'll just have time to read it and start talking. Okay, Diane. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were released, who had been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of humankind. The number of the troops of cavalry was 200 million. I heard their number, and this was how I saw the horses in my vision. The riders wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of humankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, please. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they inflict harm. The rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. Thank you. How's that for a light and happy way to wrap up a Tuesday Bible study? <laughs> but what we're seeing here is this. It's getting even worse. Instead of just inflicting pain, now it's bringing death. Interesting note, the voice that John heard talking about releasing the four angels was coming from the four horns on the altar. Now, if you picture the temple or the tabernacle back pre-temple days, you had the altar where the sacrifice would be made. And there were four things look like horns that came off of each one of the corners. And if you were in trouble, remember this is back in those days of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If you did something to harm your neighbor, they had the right to do the same thing back to you. So if somebody was out to get you, you would run to the altar and you would grab onto those horns. And when you were hanging onto those horns, you couldn't be touched. And you just waited for that person to just give up or the priest to come in and intercede and, and bring about some sort of reconciliation. But what this is saying is that it's off of that place of forgiveness and mercy. That that voice is coming that's saying, okay, Let's go. Let's bring it. And that's going to unleash this invading horde. Now, what's interesting is, again, we get this crazy description of the horses and the riders, but it's not the riders that are causing the damage. It's the horses themselves and the sulfur and fire and smoke that come out of their mouth. Now, imagine being John and getting this image of, oh, let's just, let's pick a tank. <laughs> and you're seeing an army of 200 million people coming forward, driving tanks. And what's coming out of the tank's mouth? Fire and smoke and stuff. That's just one image that some people have. Others see an Apache attack helicopter. Um, what matters isn't the physical nature of the instrument. What matters, again, is that A, God's people are spared, and B, it's getting a little nastier. And God is using all of this 
to get people's attention, to have them repent and turn back to him. And what we see is that in spite of all of that, people dig their heels in and refused to give up their false idols, their false worship. They refuse to stop doing what it is that they're not supposed to be doing. In other words, they simply refuse to turn to God. And they're getting the judgment, the just rewards for that sin. Now, again, as human beings, it's hard for us to really understand that idea of God's bringing judgment bringing death for sin. But that, again, goes back to that story in Exodus. There's these great parallels between people coming out of Egypt and, and going into the promised land and what's going to happen at the end, because it's really all about God's people throughout history coming into the end. And there's that, that story where the Israelites were grumbling and complaining and not wanting to be where they were. And so God sent poisonous snakes throughout the camp. And if you got bit by a snake, you'd die. They were asking for it. They were rejecting God in his plan. And so he said, okay, you want to die? I'll just speed up the process. But he provided the way out. If they went out into the wilderness, out into the desert, and looked upon this bronze snake that Moses had put out there wrapped around a pole, they would live. That was their way out. He's offering people a way out from judgment for sin. And what we see here is that so many people simply refuse to accept that. I'm going to stop there because I'm right at the time break. I didn't give you 10 minutes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So <laughs> um, any comments, questions? It's a lot to try to wrap our heads around. Yeah, thanks for explaining it and expanding on it it's just it's hard to respond at this point yeah. yeah new information it's tough this is a tough section it really is and it's only going to get tougher <laughs> but hopefully when we get through it all it'll start to make sense and my hope and prayer for the group is after we've gone through all of this you'll kind of take that <gasps> deep breath, and go back and reread it just like I had you do it at the beginning in a, in a different translation, one that's more readable, like hold it with the message, it's perfect, or good news or something like that. Go back and reread it now after we're all done and see if it doesn't make more sense. Yeah, Joanne. Who was John telling his dream, his vision to? The church. The church. The church. But that, that's a pretty big, I mean, it, it took days to go from one little town to another little town. Where was he saying this? In Rome? Or where was he? He was writing all this down when he was still in exile. And think of the Pony Express, how we would send letters all over the place. That's how word traveled in those days. It wasn't just John going from church to church. It's just like it wasn't Paul bringing all of his letters to all of the churches. You would write it down and you would give it to somebody and they would bring it back to their church and they would get distributed somewhere else. And that's how the word would spread. That John would write this down and put it out into the church universe and it would become part of the lexicon, it would become part of the teaching, it would become part of the everyday understanding of what the Christian faith was all about. Doesn't happen overnight. You didn't get the joy of doing a TikTok video or posting something on YouTube. He you just had to do it through the channels that were there. And thankfully there was enough time between when he was writing this vision down and when the end is coming that people have that opportunity. 
it wasn't as immediate as it really needed to be. That help? Yeah. That's all I got, folks. <laughs> Have a great week. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Have you. a great week. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.